I've tried to keep it kind of short um, so that I can open up the floor if you guys have specific questions about the projects you're working on, since I know it's a diverse group, um, that you can um, ask questions and I can cater to your interests specifically. So I've tried to keep it a little broad, maybe more towards natural resources, but um, broad in that sense. So yeah, I am going to go ahead and share my screen. So this is the um, our previous documentary. If you're interested, I'm happy to share links with Heather that she can send out or put them in the chat, whatever works if you are interested. But this was a documentary that aired on New Year's Eve on uh, Rocky Mountain PBS uh, called Tuning Out the Pandemic. Um, so I worked on this with some grad students. So this is some documentary work that we did. It's 26 minutes long. I'll just play like a few seconds of the intro um, and show some of the other stuff. Musicians are the voice of our current struggles. Awesome. So yeah, that's a 26 minute long production that we worked on there. We're working on, yeah, a similar length one now for voting at home. And we've got actually a wildfire documentary that we just got funding for um, the summer. So we'll be working with the, the Forest Service and various government organizations for that. Um, some other stuff. So I my work for the Park Service, as uh, Heather mentioned there, uh, when I was a grad student, I worked on this web series right here. It's called Outside Science, Inside Parks. So basically just very short, um, you know, three minute educational series on just raising awareness of the science that people are doing the park and that a lot of young people are involved in trying to get more young people involved, whether that be, you know, kids or some kids here, interns, um, you know, got to go down to New Mexico here, did some stuff in, Acadia and went out to Guam, did some stuff in Tennessee. Um, my boss did some of these projects as well. So that's some of the work that I did with them. So super fun. Anything from just off the side of the road to backpacking in to do some shoots. And then, yeah, some work for CSU. I did the Women in Construction Management, um, some of their promos and stuff. So just a little bit of background about what I do. And yeah, and I teach video editing the other times and visual communication as well. So I keep myself very busy all the time, but I love it. I'm super passionate about this. So, so um, yeah, an intro to shooting video. So basically um, I know we're all from different backgrounds here and we may be doing video for different purposes, but essentially your audience is going to be key to how you do your video. So essentially, um, you know, who do you want to watch your video? Are you trying to recuse recruit new people to get involved in the program? Are you trying to educate the general public? Are you maybe doing an internal video and, you know, basing their, your video on their level of knowledge is going to be very key. And then where are you posting your video, which is essentially where is your audience? You know, if you're going um, for your instructional videos, maybe how to videos, YouTube is a great place for that. Um, whereas if you're trying to outsource to new people, maybe get um, some other people interested in um, your program, social media is a great spot for that. Maybe, um, you know, it's for people who are already interested in your program and it's on your website, diving deeper into that. And I'll talk about that more as I go. Um, so basically, um, how long are people willing to stay? So if somebody goes to YouTube, they're usually going to YouTube to, you know, if they're not watching music videos, they're going there to learn something specific. Um, or maybe you've directed them to their channel. Typically YouTube audiences are more willing to stick around for, you know, three minutes, 10 minutes, maybe longer if it's something they're interested in learning, whereas a social media audience is not gonna stick around for as long. Um, Facebook tends to trend a little longer and these trends change all the time, but for the last couple of years, people are watching longer content on Facebook, whereas if you're on Instagram or something like that, it's a lot shorter. Um, 
they have room for longer content, but people are going for that quick hit. So thinking about, hey, if I'm trying to attract new people to my organization, to my site, whatever it is, I, you need to keep it short and sweet, less than a minute. Um, I know you're passionate about your topics and I get the same way of, hey, I'm so excited. Everybody should be excited too. Uh, so you wanna make a super long video, but if you're trying to attract new people, shorter is better. When they're ready, interested, when they're seeking new information. So on something like YouTube or your website, you'd want something longer. Um, and then, yeah, like, so what's the point of your video? Are, are these all, all tie together is, hey, are you trying to sell something? Are you trying to get, get people interested at first? Or are you trying to educate people who are already there? So this should be throughout your entire process in the forefront of your mind when you are shooting video is, hey, who's going to be watching this? Maybe you're making a few videos out of that same shoot, maybe something for social media and something more in depth. That's um, great too, but that should be in the forefront of your mind as you go on. Cool. Um, so then next going in, I kind of went with my natural resources uh, theme here, um, is what style of video do you want to do? Do you want to do interviews where you've got kind of a, a semi-formal situation, even if it's outside, maybe it's in an office where you're sitting down and talking to somebody and they're walking through a process or company, whatever it is, maybe um, this is ideal for marketing. And then you're going to need a little more equipment. So if you're going for something where you're going to have sit down interviews, you're going to need a microphone. You're going to need a tripod. Even if you're doing something basic and we're going to these other things, I still recommend a microphone. I'll show you some options in a second. But um, interviews, if you're doing this style of content where you're going to have sit down interviews, you're going to need the most equipment. Um, so maybe you're looking for a show and tell kind of video of like, hey, I'm going to go with the theme on my slides right here. Of like, hey, how to, you know, plant trees or how are you going to volunteer in our current project? And you want to do a show and tell to get people prepared. Um, you're either going to need to have a, a good mic hooked up to the person explaining while they're doing it, or you're going to have somebody explaining afterwards. Maybe you're going to narrate while um, in your edit and then just use the video you shot there as opposed to an interview style. Um, or maybe you're not gonna have somebody showing and telling and talking while they're doing things and doing text and narration. I'd say this is the least, this style of video requires the least amount of equipment. Um, so because you can really just use your phone, use the mic that's built into it, um, and then later in your editing software, which we go into on Thursday, add that text, maybe add some narration, record your own voice or, or somebody else's voice who you like to kind of go through it. So, um, you know, think of the type of style of content you wanna go through. They all have different purposes. Like I said, interviews and things might be good for marketing. If you're trying to teach somebody something, a show and tell is a good situation. And if you are using text and narration, you can do the least amount of equipment and really be flexible across all types of videos. So think about the style before you go out to your shoot. Okay, so I'm going to talk about very basic equipment. Um, I'm aware that some of you guys may have professional cameras already. Great. I'm going to keep this general. So whether you're using your phone or not, um, or you're using professional grade equipment, the tips from here on out will apply. But um, so here I just posted, I screenshotted this last night. Um, you know, like I said, if you're gonna be doing any kind of interview or any kind of show and tell, you need a microphone. If you want your video to look something better than just, hey, somebody picked up their phone and did something random um, and to look semi-professional, you can, I mean, iPhone, Android has put a lot of money into making cameras look good. Um, so just adding a microphone to that is going to take your work to the next level. Here, there's one specific for iPhones. It, it's under 30 bucks on Amazon. Um, it's just the first one I saw. You can look in and see there. But you're going to want to have a microphone, um, you know, maybe get an extension cord, especially if you're doing show and tell, so that your audio is really good. Um, yeah. Uh, if you're doing a phone, I would still highly recommend a tripod. You can just Google like tripods for whatever phone you are using. So now same applies to cameras. If you have a basic camera, you're going to want to get a basic microphone um, that you can clip onto somebody and you're going to want to get a tripod for your camera. 
If anybody has specific questions about equipment later, I'm happy to talk about that. I'll have my email as well. So I'm happy to be a resource moving forward as well. But that's equipment that you'll need. Um, yeah, and like I said, so a camera, honestly, that's going to be ideal. If you can get a professional grade camera, it's going to look better than if you're doing it on an iPhone or an Android or something like that. However, it's not essential to make good quality videos. It's just going to take it to the next level. So if you don't have a budget for equipment right now, don't let that deter you from making quality content. Um, that should be your next step. If you already have a camera, great. Um, let's talk about using it to the uh, max capacity here. I have my favorite entry level camera. It's the Sony Alpha 6300. I'm a huge fan of Sony's at the moment. I'm going to bring my Sony on camera in a sec, my Sony onto the camera in a second so that you can uh, see what I like to use. Um, but really, people have moved away from big equipment. The equipment is small enough to carry in your pocket if you're a guy or your person if you're a girl um and uh yeah this is a great entry level and i can talk about some step ups if you have a higher budget but this is a great video camera it's very diverse and light and yeah and then even the next step i wouldn't say that this is essential to smaller videos that you're doing is um lights or a reflector so a reflector um it's something that's you know just used to bounce light into your subject's face or you can get a little light for you know thirty dollars on amazon or something just to add um something some more clarity to whatever you're talking about or if you're doing interviews honestly my entry level students for my sophomores who come in i have them use a reflector i don't teach them anything about lighting because i I've learned the hard way with myself and with students that as you're learning something new, if you add too many tools to it, it just decreases the quality. Whereas as you get more comfortable with equipment, adding things like lights and that will help improve it. Um, that'd be nice. So yeah, uh, I would say basics to get started, you know, phone with a good camera, a tripod and a mic. That's all you need. If you have a camera, great. And then that equivalent equipment to work with that. Okay, cool. So now if you've chosen that technique where you're going to be using interviews to tell your story. So um, here you are going to want to use a tripod and you're going to want to use a microphone. So um, you're going to basically stabilize your phone or your camera somehow. Maybe you've propped it up on something. Um, when I put my camera back on, I will give you some techniques to stabilize your camera or your phone with your body but this is gonna make for a better quality. So off the bat, super easy to make your interview look like you are a professional is to frame it up in the rule of thirds. If you've dabbled in photography, you know what this is in my top image here. Basically it's if you break the screen down into a grid that you are going to put your interview subject or your interesting points on one of the thirds of that grid. So this is the basic rule of composition for photography and videography. If you're just new into this, this is probably the first rule of composition as in how to put things in the frame that you want to know. Um, so when you frame up these interviews, so like I said, you want to put them on one of those intersecting lines. Uh, cameras and phones have the ability to put this grid on screen, so you can actually do that. But as you get more comfortable, you can just eyeball it. Um, so yeah, this is a, a, the top picture is just one that I downloaded from the internet. The one at the bottom is one, a screenshot from one of my videos. So yeah, you want to make sure that your subject is off to the side of the frame and they're looking into the side of the frame um, where there is more space. So basically, you're going to set up your camera to the side of you and you're going to stand on the side of your camera where there is that space. So here, um, if you can see my mouse, so I was standing on the left side of my camera for Lynn's interview here. So I was standing on the left and I was having her look at me. So that gets to my third point here is when you are interviewing somebody, you need to tell them not to look at the lens. So if you have somebody who can help you, this is going to be super ideal. If you have a camera on a tripod there, they can just make sure that everything's recording and that it looks good. 
Um, but you want them to be looking into that look space and then you can have a conversation. If you're like me and oftentimes you're at a shoot by yourself, you know, you might want to check over to the side, but the key to getting a good interview is to have a conversation with a person and remind them that they're not looking at the lens. So yeah, have a conversation, you know, make sure that you keep quiet. That's the one part. It's, it's kind of a one-sided conversation. You kind of master the art of giving those nonverbal responses. So this is something that all new videographers learn the hard way is that they're going to ruin some interviews because they spoke over the person who was talking. We all do this in conversation. Um, you know, we, we're used to that constant, like giving, you know, a yes, or, you know, kind of laughing if somebody says something funny, but you have to turn that off as a videographer. And remember that it's not going to be usable if you interrupt them. So you set it up and you have a conversation, you make eye contact with them and you keep quiet while they're talking. So um, while you're interviewing them, you know, at the start, you typically want to encourage them to talk in full sentences. So if you're asking them to talk about, hey, what are you doing here today? So instead of the sh them just saying, um, plucking weeds, or whatever they're doing, is saying like, hey, um, today we're out here plucking weeds to make sure that the native plants have room to grow, whatever you're talking about, just that they explaining what's going in and feel free to ask them questions again, because chances are when you go to edit, which we'll talk about on Thursday, that you're going to need to explain to the audience what's going on from their interviews and pick certain parts out of their interviews to use in your video. And if they haven't explained it and have just said single word things, um, it's going to be very difficult to edit that together in a way that your audience is going to understand. So ask full questions. Don't be afraid to ask things um, a second time if they didn't explain it fully. You know, worst case scenario, you can always put text on screen if you need to or narrate. But in a best case scenario, if you've chosen to do interviews, that they, um, the people you are interviewing, have basically explained it well enough that you can chop it up and make it make sense. So this is another thing you need to keep in mind. Um, you may have 10 minute interviews, 15 minute interviews, gosh, maybe hour long interviews for your one to three minute project. So a huge part of your editing is going to be cutting that down. And that is super normal. Like today, I was at a shoot. The interview was an hour long and I'm a, it's, it's still very stressful because we have a lot of cutting down to do because our documentary with not even over-exaggerating at least 50 different people in is 40 minutes long. So you're going to be cutting things down. So it's very rare that somebody has a whole you know, discussion where you're going to just throw it in there. You're going to be editing this later. So keep that in mind as you're hanging, um, interviewing them. Think about things that they've missed. Um, and this will come with experience of like, hey, um, you know, did you, you know, they may have explained what they were doing, but what's the context? Like, why are they out there doing that task? That's going to be important to your final video. Um, yeah, so like I said, don't be afraid to ask somebody to do it again. Um, maybe ask them to do it shorter. Be like, okay, cool. So can you give me an elevator pitch for what you're doing here? Or in one sentence, what are you doing here? That'll help your editing easier. And also remember that you are guys are, you're going to be making a video. You're not making a podcast. You're not making a article with some pictures. You're going to have to show what the person was talking about. So while you're using this sit down interview, you're likely going to be showing other things while the person is talking. So, you know, when you're watching documentary content or even movies or ads or whatever it is, when somebody's talking, you're usually looking at something else other than their face after they've been introduced. So if they're going on a tangent about all the research they do in their lab, think to yourself, hey, is this the most visual story? You know, maybe you can mention that in a sentence, but you really want to focus your video on something that you can go and get B-roll for, which is my next topic. So let's go there. There we go. So B-roll. So now this is going to apply if you've cho chosen to do something that's not um, that's not going to include interviews. This is going to be an essential part of your story. And if, if you are using interviews, you're still going to need this. So B-roll are essentially your puzzle pieces that are going to put it all together. This is everything that is not an interview. Those are the clips that you see in movies, documentaries, ads of just people doing things. 
the subject, whatever it is, this is called B-roll in the industry. And this is the bread and butter of what you're doing. So, like I said, this is a visual story. So you're going to think about, okay, so I spoke to Lynn was a person I was talking to there. I was talking to uh, her about hummingbirds and how they use them as um, an indicator species for the health of the prairie. So, you know, I was going to ask her, I asked her about things I saw that day. I was like, hey, so when the hummingbirds land on the feeder, what are you doing there? Or how do you attract them there? Or maybe you heard her say, hey, the hummingbirds land on the feeder and then we catch them in the snatch. Then you wanna go later and get that feed roll. So everything is interconnected. When you're doing your interviews, you're thinking about the footage, the B-roll that you're gonna get. And when you're getting your B-roll, you're thinking about the interviews that you have gotten or have already got. So this is visually supporting your story. Um, so I'd like to point out here that I, you don't want to do vertical video. So you want to hold your phone sideways unless you're doing something for social media, like an Instagram story or Snapchat or a Facebook story. But if it's going in the main feed, you want to turn your phone sideways. If it's going on your website, if it's going on YouTube, you have to have it horizontal like I have it in these slides here. So um, make sure you're not holding your phone vertical unless it is something live like that. And I'm happy to discuss that in more detail if people are interested. But for the most part, my video career is horizontal, so landscape, making sure you're holding your phone sideways or holding the, the camera the correct way. Um, if you're a photographer, you know, portrait photography definitely works. You can hold it um, in different orientations, but people can't turn their screens to watch a whole video that way. So um, make sure you're shooting the right way. So the thing that's going to take your video to the next, ooh, sorry about that, to the next level, um, as opposed to an amateur shooting a video to look like somebody who, hey, knows what they're doing, even if this is just your first video, is having still shots. I know we watch these films, these social media videos with cool transitions and movement and all these things. But if you are not trained and experienced in this, it is so challenging to get right. Um, so what is gonna make your videos look better is still shots. So maybe one to two pans. And when I say that is you're moving the camera from left to right and showing a landscape and you wanna rotate and show the whole scene, that's okay but the bulk of your video is going to be shooting still shots. So when you are shooting your video and you're shooting your B-roll, you wanna think in terms of shot sizes, and my next slide breaks this down, of hey, of you wanna get close-ups and you wanna get different shot sizes. So I'm actually gonna cycle forward there and show you what I mean by that. So you wanna get a variety of different shot types or sizes like this. So you wanna get some wide shots, which are gonna show your whole scene, maybe a whole room. If you're outside the landscape, what people are doing. Then uh, you wanna get some medium shots. So, um, you know, not the whole scene, but able to see some detail of people, maybe multiple people in the same shot, but more detail than the whole landscape. And then close ups. So, showing detail, showing people's faces, um, and showing like what their hands are doing. So, sometimes we call that cutaways um, of, hey, you know, Lynn maybe demonstrated what, um, you know, she was doing with the hummingbirds there. I want to get a close up of her hands of showing that. And that's another thing that's going to take your video to the next level that I've learned from working with students for um, a while now is Newer videographers um, tend to just go for all wide and medium shots and forget to get close. And that's really gonna take you to the next level is those still shots, shots and getting closer to your subject. So the way I like to explain it is imagine walking into a room. So we are looking at a conference room right now. What do your eyes do when you walk into a room or a landscape or outside? Usually you do a pan, maybe you look around and look at your surroundings. So you wanna start, get your wide shot. Then you start to zoom in with your eyes or your feet and see like, hey, where am I going? What do I look at here? Um, and so then you go and you get that medium shot, some more details. And then you start to get more focused as you work on a task, like as you're 
going on my side. It's like planting a tree. You're focusing in on like, hey, like how deep is this hole? What am I working on here? And your eyes are looking in close-ups. So you don't want your viewer to have to dig in your wide shot for what they're supposed to look at. You want to move with your feet and show them with your camera. And in your edit later, you're going to edit this together. Okay. Um, <laughs> I just saw in the stat in the um, chat here, my accent, I'm South African. <laughs> so I've been here for 10 years. And when I teach and I talk on Zoom, it comes out way more. So uh, Greg, that's where I am <laughs> from. So I grew up there, my whole family's still there. Um, just so you all aren't perplexed by where I'm from. Um, so yeah, and then also to answer your other question about gimbal stabilizers, sticks, um, in lieu of a tripod? Absolutely. So that's more of an advanced technique. If you know how to use a gimbal and a stabilizer to really add that ad advanced motion to your shot, um, by all means do it. You don't want to overuse it. But if you're able to use that equipment, I highly encourage it. It's going to add production value. Um, and honestly, using a stabilizer, even for your still shots, it's going to add a slight bit of movement, which going into um, in depth, it creates a more modern look when there's a slight bit of movement, it actually looks more natural, but I'm not talking about it right now because again, you have so many things to think about on a shoot. If you've never used a gimbal or a stabilizer, um, which is, you know, a device to make sure that your camera is steady, um, and to create that smooth motion that our hands just are not capable of doing. Um, you know, you end up missing your story or forgetting about all these other things. So yeah, I'm all for those. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to talk about that when I wrap up this more. If I have any questions? Thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, feel free. If anybody else has any questions, just throw it up in the chat here and I'll address it as I go. Yeah, so um, circling back to my previous slide, if Google Slides is going to cooperate, there we go. Um, so yeah, so you want to vary those shot sizes. You want to get a few wide shots, medium, and then tight, 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 because our eyes are look at the world in medium and close-up shots. Um, getting closer is going to take your video to the next level. Another thing you want to think about is what is the sound going on around you? Uh, you know, especially if somebody's watching on YouTube, they're going to be listening to your story on social media. It's debatable. A lot of people listen on mute, um, but they, um, they're going to be listening. So if you're talking the entire time while you're shooting all this video, you're not going to be able to use that sound really, unless you're describing what's going on. Uh, so think about the sound that's going on around you and it's going to make your video feel more real. So um, if, for example, if you are putting a hammer to the ground, you know, a very distinct sound, if your viewer cannot hear the sound associated with the hammer hitting the ground when they're watching your video, it's not gonna feel real. So this is another thing newer producers instinctively get rid of is they get rid of the sound or they don't think about it in the field, they don't think about the edit and their videos just feel like there's something missing. So these are simple things that are gonna make intro videos feel like a professional. Um, so those are things to think about there. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll get into tips for music in a bit as well. Um, so, um, yeah, and even if you do have music and you're going to be using music, you still want to get what we call natural sound when you're getting your B-roll. So I'm looking at this conference room right now. The natural sound would be somebody talking. Maybe there's a vent in the background. Um, and even though that's not providing knowledge, it's still creating a feel that's going to make it more realistic. So even if you're planning to add music to your entire video, which I actually highly encourage you do. And this probably suits better to the editing session on Thursday um, is still think about sound. It's gonna make your video feel more full in terms of the audio. Um, so the, um, yeah, unless you're doing something really like audio central, like I did a video on rattlesnakes and I was like, there was no music there because they were the stars of the show. So if you need sound for your story, absolutely no music, but I would say, 90% of your videos highly recommend music. And I'll talk a bit about copyright on Thursday on picking music for your story. So um, this is my step-by-step -step on how to get good B-roll. So now you've got, whether it's your phone, your camera or whatever it is, 
um, you know, you're going to set up your composition. So I do days of lectures on composition in my classes on um, basically how to make your shot look good. But, you know, for now, you know, do some YouTube videos or you look with your eyes like, hey, does this shot look pretty or something off? Maybe you've done photography before and you can actually say what that is. But um, if you're not at that level, just use your taste and be like, okay, something doesn't look right. What if I just move my feet to a different part of the room and see what it looks like? Um, and looking for, you know, if somebody's posing weird or if, you know, there's somebody who's in the shot who shouldn't be just looking for that. Um, and then using your tripod or your body's tripod to get that still shot. So setting it up, making sure you know how to use it. Um, okay, keeping cuts to minute when you first start doing video, do you mean per shot, not the entire video? Um, okay, Taryn, do you mind going on it and um, putting, turning yourself off mute to elaborate there? Yeah, I was wondering if that would <laughs> make sense. Sure. I just think that earlier you said, um, like I think the tendency of people when they start is to want to like move the camera around a lot. So, and you said, keep it to like one or two movements. You mean like per section of video, not like overall, because I'm assuming you can like cut the, the overall video multiple times. So am I like understanding that correctly? And did that question make sense? Yes, absolutely. So that's a great question. So in the video world, we call that shots. So every time you make a cut in your edit and you move to another topic, that's a cut. So when I say you want to keep movement to a minimum, like in that one shot, so you don't want to be moving around a lot. Let me actually um, stop my, um, I'm going to start my video and stop my share for just a second there. Um, so here I've got my phone in my hand right now. So if I'm doing a shot of my screen right here, I'm going to stand here. I'm going to lock my elbows in and I'm going to hold my camera like this. And I'm going to stand here and hit record. As you saw on my slide there, I said count to 10. And I'm just not going to move as much as I can for that 10 seconds. If I have a tripod, it takes it out. And you're going to use a small part of that. So when I say you don't add movement, like I don't want to do, um, like if I wanted to show the individual names on my chat or whatever, I wouldn't want to do this kind of motion and make that one shot. What I would do instead, I was like, use lots of shots. So I would do one shot like this and I'd count to 10. And then I would move again and get another shot closer and then another shot of something different. And so you are gonna have lots of different shots of B-roll, but they're all still in themselves. So if you wanna show multiple things, don't do it in one motion. So you don't wanna show everything all together. You know, you might want to do one pan of like, hey, here's maybe my introduction shot of my whole scene. But after that, it's going to be a series of different size shots, lots of them. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, but not a lot of motion. OK, great. Glad I answered that. Mia, yeah, here, let me grab my camera from back here. Um, so yeah, same thing with a camera. If you have a tripod, great. Um, use that. I don't have any tripods near me at the moment. But if you don't, um, or you're in a spot where you can't have a tripod or it's awkward to set up, you don't have time, use your body as the tripod. So here, even if you work on the gym every single day, you cannot hold something out here and it be stable for more than three seconds. And it just, you start to have a lot of motion. So lock your elbows into your body and think of points of content and contact and hold the camera still. And so try breathe shallow and you get more experience with this and just lock your, keep it close to you and hold as still as you can. Um, yeah, it still works. It's, it's going to take a little more thought. The tripod kind of makes a thought unless you hit record and you step, go, step away. Um, I prefer to shoot freehand now because usually I have a limited amount of time and I have to get a lot of things. Um, but still sometimes I'm like, well, that wasn't usable because I got tired and I started shaking or I got distracted because I get really excited in my shoots. And I'm like, oh, this is cool. And it just gives you the temptation to have two short shots. So um, switching back to my slides right here. So um, yeah, so that's what I'm talking about here is, you know, use your tripod or your body. So you're gonna hit record and you're going to count to 10. The reason I say count to 10 is because this gives you wriggle room. When we talk about editing on Thursday, you're gonna find out that you're actually only using about 
two to maybe five seconds of every shot that you get. So um, it seems like a really short amount of time, but that's like five seconds is an eternity in terms of videos. So um, you're gonna count to 10, that's gonna give you enough wiggle room that you have a stable shot that gives your audience enough time to process what they're seeing. And then you're gonna move on to something else and move to your close up or your wider shot or something like that. So that's what you're gonna do. So you're gonna set up your shot, you're gonna hit record, don't move, count to 10, hit stop, move your feet. Don't zoom with your fingers on your phone or your zoom on your lens. Get closer, get a couple of medium shots, rinse and repeat, get a couple of close ups um, and rinse and repeat. So that's basically what you're doing. You're doing that same process of hitting record, not moving, counting to 10 over and over again so that you have hopefully, you know, for a minute video that you have like 40, 50 different options that you can use in that video. Cause even if you're a pro, you're not gonna be able to use all of your footage. So you're going to need to get um, way more than you think you need. Okay, so there we go. Okay, so my um, final tips here, um, uh, to just overall is keep still, like I said, and I've said this a lot, you know, feel free to experiment. SD cards are cheap. You probably have a lot of storage on your phone or you can pay a few bucks for some iCloud storage. I'm not sure what the Android equivalent is. Um, but, you know, feel free to experiment, but have a lot of still shots. So if you have a few pans, it's great. Get still. So like I said, get more than you think you need. Um, both in terms of shot length, if you are handheld especially, you're going to be attempted to move it. And I do this all the time, even though um, I've worked on a ton of projects, it's I still get distracted by things. I'm like, oh, I should reframe or do this. And then I end up with a bunch of one second unusable shots. So get more shots than you need and leave them on for longer than you need. You're going to cut these down in the edit, so it's okay. Get closer, like I said, intro videographers tend to just stay wide. Um, when I say shoot and move is you wanna get variety in your shots. So show something from different angles, show different people, just get diversity. You know, you wanna get a wide, medium and tight shot of the same thing, um, but then you don't wanna just have the same thing for your entire minute video, get different angles, get different people. Um, yeah, always be thinking about how you edit it. So this all like video is thinking about a lot of different things at once of, hey, at the end of the day, you're gonna have to turn around and actually put this together. If, okay, well, did I get enough interview content to talk about all this B-roll? Did they answer all my questions? Did I get enough B-roll to supplement my interviews? Did I have a plan of what I'm gonna do a how-to video? Maybe I don't have any interviews and I'm doing narration. Did I get all the shots that I need for the script that I plan to write or that I already wrote? Um, and then in terms of aesthetics, so AKA making it look good, just make sure it's in focus. This is way easier with an iPhone or an Android. You just tap on where you want it to focus on cameras. This is another thing. So when I said earlier, if you have budget and patience for cameras, get that. Um, when I say patience is because it adds another variable. There's a lot of things to think about and having to figure out your equipment in the field is something you don't wanna do. So if you're not sure how to get your camera in focus, you're better off with your phone. So really learn that equipment um, and make sure you know how to do that. Um, you know, think about lighting, even though I've said, hey, you may not be using lighting equipment. Um, think about, hey, well, my subject's really dark. What if I turn the other way around and I put the sun at my back? That's a great tip. You wanna put your light source, whether that be a fluorescent in a building on your back, because if it's on your back, the light is on your subject. Wanna worry about shadows, but if you've got your back to the light, the light is hitting your subject. Yeah, like I said, learn your equipment, whether you're using your iPhone, like there's a whole bunch of settings. Um, I try to not waste, like not waste my time, but like spend too much time on short seminars like this on things that you could spend time Googling. Um, so like, you know, you can Google like, hey, how do I change settings on my iPhone? Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about that and things, or how do I, adjust the setting on this camera, whatever. Um, just, you know, make sure that you understand it. And yeah, keep quiet, you know. Um, when you're doing your interviews, ask the questions. You want the person to be engaged and interested, but you don't want to interrupt. When you're getting that B-roll, you may want to prompt people um, to say things, but uh, I have ruined many a clip. My students have ruined many a clip by talking over something. Um, and yeah, so that's how my wrap up. I have to 
because we'll talk about copyright on Thursday very, very briefly. I got these slides from there, so those are my credits. Um, hopefully I'll see you guys on Thursday for editing, but I'm happy to be here as a resource. There's my email. I know Heather will give that to you and I'm pretty sure she has already. Find me on LinkedIn. Um, I wouldn't say I don't post a ton, but I definitely reply to messages and things like that. That was great, Jesse. Thank you. A lot of great yeah. tips there. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. I don't see any additional ones in the chat right now, but uh, any um, any questions or clarifications that you'd like to ask Jesse here? You know, Jesse, I was wondering about the preparation ahead of time. Um, and do you, I, I'm imagining for some of these things that you spend quite a bit of time talking to the people that you're going to be um, interviewing or um, just where you're going to be and kind of an out, do you produce some kind of outline or series of kind of topics um, and therefore imagery? Uh, I'm assuming there's some major planning ahead of time here. Absolutely. Um, so basically, it really depends on the shoot for marketing style videos. If you're doing an ad or something, that's going to require a lot of prep of like, hey, who's going to be in this? What kind of vision is this in line with our brand? Like what shots are we going to get um, in terms of like documentary content um, or like just showcasing maybe um, something that people are doing in the field? Honestly, like just making sure that people are aware that you have a camera if they're minors releases are a thing, you know, releases like in terms of adults if somebody is like interviewing and they're looking at the lens they've given consent they can see their own camera like they're not gonna be able to dispute that but minors are a thing um but yeah just making sure everybody's aware that you're gonna be shooting what it's for and that they're comfortable um but yeah in terms of pre-produced things we do things with like storyboards um i mean that's a huge thing in film like if you're doing a script uh, where you're going to be narrating through the whole thing, maybe a show and tell. Maybe you want to write that script ahead of time so that you know exactly what footage to get. Um, and that maybe you've like sketched out, filmmakers do this all the time and, you know, marketers do this all the time of like, hey, what do you envision? And this may help like if you have to go somewhere for a shoot, especially um, if you want to show like your boss of like, hey, this is what I envisioned for this project. I've sketched it out. These are stick figures. Do you like this? And then it helps you feel more prepared in the field. Um, yeah, so I, it kind of splits the field. Um, that's that's why I love documentary contact. The prep content, the preparation is logistics and making sure everybody knows I arrive and all the work is kind of in the back end and in the field, whereas marketing and pre-scripted stuff, it's a lot more heavy lifting in the front. Yeah. Um, and then I see there's a question from Nicole, are there any tricks to use to help your interview feel at ease in front of the camera? Yeah, so honestly, um, and we're doing this today. So having a conversation with them. So while you're setting up your gear or talking to them, um, just talking about, um, you know, what they're up to or how their day's going. And um, I, teach, I teach my teaching like stand-up comedy and I kind of approach interviews the same way. Maybe jokes don't come naturally, but I like, I'll make a sarcastic comment or joke or anything. Um, honestly, just like making a person feel comfortable. And then um, before you get the camera rolling and then reminding them of like, hey, like pretend the camera's not even there and have a conversation. So yay for vaccines because moths have kind of ruined my interview techniques because so much of getting the person to be at ease other than that upfront conversation is those nonverbal cues. Cause I don't want to talk, but if somebody's saying something interesting like I'll smile and nod and I'll do my silent little laugh. Or if somebody's saying something serious you know that serious nod that you give it's gonna encourage them to keep talking. Um, and just eye contact because new interviews like, oh no, I have to get through my list and they're staring at their question list. And if you're talking to somebody who's looking the opposite way, you're like, are you listening to what I'm saying? So basically just trying to remind them, this is a conversation, you know, sure it, there's a camera here, but do your best to just pretend they're not. Longer interviews, by the, like if you're going for 20 minutes, by 20 minutes, they've forgotten it's there. Um, but also there's just some people who aren't good on camera, unfortunately. And that's okay because they've got other skills that I probably am terrible at. <laughs> so like, it's, it's just different, you know, sometimes you just gotta cut your losses and be like, well, I've done everything I can. They're not gonna be awesome in camera, you know, thank them for their time and, you know, move on. But yeah, that's what I plan to do. Um, cool, how do you frame, 
questions to get interviews to speak more directly to get a quote or a topic you are looking for. Um, so this is a lot easier in PR versus news. So news, uh, that's unethical, but I don't think anybody here is in broad journalism or more doing like PR or marketing. Um, I mean, leading questions. Um, so just, um, Tell me about why, like, tell me about why it's so important to get young people involved in science. This is like, um, or tell me how much fun you're having today. Um, or I'm trying to think, so a topic you're, this is probably more serious topics. Or, you know, tell me about the damage um, single use plastics are doing here and tell me how bad this is for the ocean. So again, unethical in news, you cannot do that if you're doing this for news. Um, but in terms of PR, you know, it's understood that, hey, you're trying to make an organization look good or marketing of like, hey, we're all here for common goal of asking the question and kind of having the answer that you want to know in there. I know there'll be people, people who find me on that and be like, that's unethical. But like, if you're doing marketing, you're selling something, you're trying to promote a goal, that's what you're going to do. So leading questions are going to be from the, for the win. If you have a rapport with them, I've told people who have like hired me, I'm like, okay, I need you to say this because I'm promoting this. Um, tell me in one sentence why we need women in construction management right now. I'll say the sentence. I'm like, in your own words, words tell me why women create a more unique perspective in construction management. So I'll just tell them what I want them to say. <laughs> Um, if it's not for journalism, because otherwise, yeah, that's what I have to do. So, um, yeah, so, uh, Gray, I'm not sure uh, after this, if you want to speak up, I'm not sure what you mean by I have a question better. Oh, better spoken. Oh, go ahead, Greg, if you want to put your well, I was um, say, go ahead and take Nicole's question, because I've already asked a few. OK, sure. Um, so do you have any tips for collaborative teams coming together to create a video when you've got Ooh, um, the struggle every day of my life. Um, um, so it, it really, there's something to be said about, you know, like a hierarchy and there's like, when there's too many cooks in the kitchen, we have that coming up right now is we have five type A personalities on a project right now. And I'm like, okay, we're going to have to, we're going to have to figure out who's directing, who's the videographer, who's in charge of what is like designating duties and figuring out like, Hey, where your expertise are. Um, you know, if somebody is an, expert in you know marketing um being like hey well, what are people interested in us like okay great so you can tell me like what people want to see but maybe you're not very good at operating a camera and executing that vision so please don't you know you don't say please don't tell me how to do my job but um hey you know in a polite way of hey this is your expertise hey help me like execute your vision um is I would say that's my best tip is figuring out like, hey, what are your strengths? Uh, you know, sometimes it gets a little more challenging when people's strengths overlap, but it's like um, playing to people's strengths and giving people different jobs because not everybody can be the executive producer and have their vision executed for the project. And maybe sometimes I'm like, hey, maybe we should make two videos. Let's make one video, one minute, the way I want to do it. And let's make one minute, one the way you want to do it. Um, and then everybody wins. So that's if you have time, but jobs. Cool. Um, okay. So uh, I don't want to go over time here. Um, but yeah, if we, if I'm happy to stay on longer, if people need, would like to ask a few more questions. But yeah, go ahead and wrap up, Heather. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jesse. And um, and yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up now. But if a few folks want to stay with a couple more questions, we can do that for a few more moments. But great questions, everybody. And thank you. And Jesse, this is really great. 